Hey guys, Barky here, back with another Iceberg video. In this video, we'll be covering The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, so sit back, grab yourself a Coke Zero, and enjoy. Let's get right into it. Hero of the Wild Armor The Hero of the Wild set is an armor set in Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom, and Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. According to legend, this cap was crafted for a hero who travels the wildlands. The three pieces will be awarded upon completing all 120 shrines, and is the objective of the quest A Gift from the Monks. The set can be enhanced by visiting one of the various great fairies, and can be dyed at the Kokchi dye shop. When enhanced by two levels, it provides Master Sword Beam Up. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Crossover On November 9th, 2017, Nintendo added a free DLC to Breath of the Wild. Link will obtain the Salvager set by completing this DLC side quest. The description of the side quest gives you three clues of where to find the outfit. 1. The southern sky from the middle of the largest bridge. 2. The eastern sky from the skull's left eye. And 3. The southeastern sky from the peak of the tall, pierced, snowy mountain. Satori Mountain and the Lord of the Mountain the Lord of the Mountain is one of the creatures found in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. The Hyrule Compendium says, quote, This noble creature watches over all the animals that make their homes in the forest. Legends say this holy creature is a reincarnation of a sage that died on the lands it now protects. It has acute awareness of its surroundings, so it seldom appears before people. It's sometimes known by its other name, Satori. You can find him on top of Satori Mountain, near the Cherry Blossom, whenever it glows green. He'll let you ride him if you're quick enough, but it takes a ton of stamina to do so. Unfortunately, you can't register him at a stable, and if you leave him alone for too long, he'll disappear, so you better keep track of him. DLC Armor In the Master Trials DLC mode for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Link will be able to find new DLC armor in chests scattered around the world. These chests will contain useful and cosmetic pieces of armor and equipment only available to those who have purchased the DLC, and many are references to previous Zelda games. The chest locations can be seen on the interactive map, and these chests can be found the Travel Medallion, which allows you to create fast travel points and warp to that spot anywhere on the map, the Korok Mask, which shakes and lights up if a Korok is hiding nearby, Majora's Mask, which makes it harder for enemies to spot you, Midna's Helmet, which provides increased resistance to attacks from Guardians, Tingle's Set, which includes Tingle's Shirt, Tights, and Hood, and if worn together, triggers Night Speed Up, and the Phantom Set, which includes the Phantom Helmet, Greaves, Armor, and boosts your attacks. Mecker Island Mecker Island is located within Lake Mecker, directly west of the Great Hyrule Forest. The area is littered with bones, and when Link draws near, a whole bunch of choo-choo will appear. At nighttime, the place is overrun by undead enemies, including Stalkoblin, Stalazalfos, and Stalmoblin. There are a number of really strange things about this island, and notably that if you climb the tree, the wind blows exactly west. There's a single burnt-out campfire under a branch, so it'll never be put out by the rain, and the island itself has a bunch of weird holes in it, and there are bones everywhere. I've heard a ton of theories as to what this all could mean, from the island being the moon from Majora's Mask, to the island being built on top of bones and symbolizing death. What do you guys think? The Eighth Heroine Outside of Gerudo Town, you'll find a man named Bozai, and if you talk to him, you'll unlock the Eighth Heroine side quest. To complete the quest, you need to find the Eighth Heroine and take a picture of it. It's a statue located in the Gerudo Highlands. Until Tears of the Kingdom came out, the 8th heroine was shrouded in mystery, and all we knew was that some of the Gerudo worshipped it. Thanks to the latest game, its purpose and history is clarified, but I won't be discussing that here, since a lot of people haven't played the game yet. Hino's Blood Moon Freakout Hino is an inhabitant of Hyrule Kingdom who resides at the Dueling Peaks Stable. He's a researcher focused on the phenomenon of Blood Moon. Each night, he stays up until 3 a.m. in order to observe the moon, at which point he decides to sleep. Should Link reveal that he knows nothing about the blood moon, Hino will tell him that in some nights, the moon rises blood red, and at midnight, revives all the monsters that have been defeated thus far. 
Due to it being a common occurrence, there is not much research into why it happens, but this does not dissuade Hino. However, he admits that he has no idea why this is happening. He asks Link to tell him if he finds any information on what exactly causes the blood moon to rise. During a blood moon, Hino will grow agitated and begin to run around the Dueling Peaks stable, screaming. If Link talks to him during this time, he may witness him growling, basking in the color of the moon, and claiming that his blood is boiling, or reveling in the revival of monsters. He calms down at 12.30 a.m., and when Link speaks to him during this time, he asks if he was also observing the blood moon. Now that the blood moon has passed, Hino states that it is time to wait for the next one. Style Horses Style Horses, also known as bony horses, are creatures in the Breath of the Wild. They're undead skeletal horses, reanimated by Ganon's magic. However, style horses behave and function like regular horses and pose no threat to Link. They only appear at night as they cannot maintain their bone structure during the day. If a stall horse is present as the sun rises, it will fall into pieces and disappear. They are usually encountered with stalk hoblins or buck hoblins riding on their backs. They can eat carrots and apples despite not having a stomach, though they cannot be registered at a stable. If Link tries to register one at a stable, the stable owner will call it a monster and refuse to board it, as it might eat the other horses. However, this is apparently superstition, as stall horses are shown to behave identically to their living counterparts. Domesticated livestock such as cows, sheep, goats, and Hylian retrievers will flee from stall horses due to their monstrous appearance. Timeline Placement In an interview with Game Rant, Hidemaru Fujibayashi, the director of Breath of the Wild, says it takes place in an age long, long after any of the titles released to date. It is the most recent age. And because of this, we believe players will be able to easily immerse themselves in the game. And of course, regardless of time period, the story does unfold in Hyrule, so for those who have played the other titles in the series, there will be a lot of recognizable places to enjoy." End quote. This is a very interesting statement, since Breath of the Wild is confirmed to be taking place possibly thousands of years after all the other games, it heavily implies that all the other stories have been passed down and are now considered legends of Zelda. But this doesn't answer the question of what timeline does Breath of the Wild take place in? We know it's a direct sequel to Age of Calamity, and Tears of the Kingdom is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, and Age of Calamity is set in an alternate timeline with no games before it. Leviathan Skeletons Three Leviathan skeletons found in Breath of the Wild are speculated to be the skeletons of King Dodongo, the Windfish, and Oshus, the Ocean King. Dodongo's skeleton is found in Elden, home of Dodongos. Its head is distinctly more reptilian than the other leviathans. More importantly, it has legs, not fins, as shown by how its first segment sticks out much more than a normal fin. The windfish has wing stumps on its back and front and back fins, separate from the stumps. For Oshus, this one may be a bit of a stretch, but there's not much to go on since it's not as visible as the other two leviathans. For those who haven't played Phantom Hourglass, Oshus is the guardian of the sea that takes the form of a giant whale, much like the Hebrew Leviathan. After being attacked by the evil phantom, Bellum, he was forced to hide and took the form of an old man. There are two major factors to take into consideration here. One, Oshus is one of the two major characters to take form of a baleen whale, with the other being Levias from Skyward Sword. Two, the reason that this isn't Levias is because of the Hebra Leviathan is encased in ice, aka frozen water. Oshus is the only one of the two baleen whales in Zelda that are related to water. But that, that's legitimately just a theory. Lurlin Village has the same layout as Outset Island. Lurlin is a village in Southeast Farron, and its main trade is fishing. Outset Island is a location from Wind Waker that Link, his sister, his grandmother, and several others live on. Some consider Lurlin Village to be a homage to the Wind Waker location alongside a Hawaiian slash Polynesian aesthetic. You have an ocean lookout tower, more characteristic of a coastal settlement than anything Zelda-specific, in my opinion, and a collection of houses vaguely in the same locations alongside additional houses, 
a port or ocean dock, and an animal enclosure relatively around where you'd imagine Rose's pig enclosure would be. The problem with the theory that Lurelin Island and Outset Island are the same is that you'd have to assume that at one point, Hyrule was deflooded and Outset Island sank down to the surface since Lurelin is surface level. Blood Moon Cooking Bonuses Crafting a health restoring meal under a Blood Moon can grant up to three additional hearts for players to regain. Seeing as there is no limit to where players can eat, meals cooked under the Blood Moon can ensure victory during the most dangerous of fights. Under the Blood Moon, recipes have the potential to gain plus one level to the effect present in the dish. These dishes also become more valuable to shopkeepers and can be sold for more rupees. This is extremely valuable to players during Breath of the Wild's early game, where rupees are in shorter supply. Since the Blood Moon creates a lot of obstacles for the player, it's nice to have this extra buff on food when you need it the most. Daytime Blood Moons Though it is very rare to encounter, a glitched Blood Moon can appear during the game's daytime hours. As of now, the exact reason that the glitch happens is unknown, but the cause is commonly attributed to when the game faults and reads the in-game clock incorrectly. The game will read the AM hours and PM hours as being reversed. This essentially tricks it into thinking that a blood moon needs to appear immediately. Unfortunately, this glitch can be very frustrating for players as it can leave them in dangerous situations if they are in a location that was home to slain monsters. The Dragon Portal one of the most mysterious and awe-inspiring things about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild are its collection of dragons. These massive flying serpents seemingly appear from nowhere, but if you pay attention, you'll discover they actually emerge from magical portals in the sky. You can actually fly up to it and go through it to follow the dragon. Well, not really, but you can go up to it. The YouTuber Medi333 did this in a video, and unfortunately, the portal just disappears and turns into a cloud texture. After going through the portal, the dragon can be seen going in the same direction for a while, then completely vanishing all at once. It's a sad day for all those dragon fans out there, but really, you shouldn't be stalking them like that. It's rude. The Master Sword has been returned to the forest. You can actually get rid of the Master Sword in Breath of the Wild through a glitch. To do the glitch, you have to overload the game's memory system by activating several arrows at once. If you succeed in dropping it, it won't just drop to the ground. A message will appear saying, quote, the Master Sword has returned to the forest, and the Master Sword will fly across the land to the Lost Woods where you can retrieve it again. Pretty cool. Holes in the World Map There are tons of holes in the world map of Breath of the Wild. This has got to be some sort of error on the part of the developers, because it allows you to essentially no-clip out of bounds and go underground where you clearly aren't supposed to be. I do wonder if Tears of the Kingdom has things like this, but I hope not. Link's Family In some concept of Breath of the Wild art, we can see Link with his father and younger sister. This is all we know about his family from Breath of the Wild, besides his father being a knight, at the starting point of Breath of the Wild, though, his father and sister have been dead for at least a hundred years. SOS and SAD in the Divine Beast's music. Unfortunately, I can't play any of the music for you because of copyright laws, but I can tell you that you can audibly hear the Morse code for SOS and SAD in the beginnings of the Divine Beast's background music. Allow me to give a bit of history to give this entry some context. 10,000 years ago, the Sheikah built Ruta the Elephant, Udania the Salamander, Mido the Eagle, and Naboris the Camel to combat the anticipated revival of Calamity Ganon. Together, they proved powerful in paving the way to victory. They were then buried for a hundred years and excavated to fight Calamity Ganon. Ganon sent the four Blight Ganons to take out the Divine Beasts, and it worked. Calamity Ganon made the Divine Beasts work in his favor and when Link finally awoke from the Shrine of Resurrection, he set out to free the Divine Beasts from Ganon's control. With that out of the way, it's possible that the reason we can hear SOS and SAD in their music is because something inside of them 
knows they're being controlled by Ganon, and he's making them do his bidding. The distress call is all they can do to reach out, and meanwhile, they're wreaking havoc on Hyrule against their will. Truly sad. But that is, that is my own personal theory. Unused Divine Beast and Guardian Designs In Breath of the Wild, there are several unused Divine Beast and Guardian designs that were discovered through data mining and exploration. These designs give insight into the development process of the game and reveal alternative concepts that were considered but ultimately, obviously, not included in the final version. Number 1. Divine Beast Toyasa This unused Divine Beast was meant to be located in Gerudo Desert. It had a unique camel-like appearance with humps on its back and a mechanical design reminiscent of the other Divine Beasts. 2. Divine Beast Uomun Another unused Divine Beast, Uomun was planned to be situated in the Laneru Wetlands area. Unlike the other beasts, Uomun had a fish-like design with fins and scales. It was intended to swim throughout the water instead of walking on land. 3. Guardian Stalker Variant in addition to the regular Guardian Stalkers found throughout Hyrule, there was an unused variation of the design. This Guardian Stalker had its legs positioned closer to its body, giving it a different appearance and possibly different movement patterns. It's important to note that these designs were probably early concepts or alternate ideas that were either scrapped or replaced in the final game. Zora's Trident Rumors in Breath of the Wild, the Zora are one of the main races that Link encounters throughout his journey. They reside in Zora's domain and play a significant role in the game's storyline. The Zora Trident, a weapon associated with the Zora, is initially seen in the possession of King Dorophon, the ruler of the Zora. Rumors surrounding the Zora Trident arose from the player's observations and discussions about the weapon's potential availability to Link. Some players speculated that it might be possible to acquire the Trident, either through a questline or by defeating King Dorovan. Others theorized that there could be hidden locations or events that would lead to obtaining the powerful weapon. However, it's important to note that these rumors were never confirmed by Nintendo or the game developers. The Zora Trident remains in the possession of King Dorovan throughout the entirety of Breath of the Wild and players are unable to obtain it as a usable weapon. The Forgotten Temple is the ruins of Skyward Sword's Fallen Temple. In Skyward Sword, the Sealed Temple is a key location in the game. It serves as the hub for Link's adventures and is the place where the Goddess Sword is initially located. It is also the dwelling place of the Goddess Hylia and plays a pivotal role in the game's storyline. In Breath of the Wild, the Forgotten Temple is a hidden location in the northeastern region of Hyrule. It is a ruined temple overrun by guardians, ancient machines that pose a significant threat to players. The temple is filled with broken pillars and crumbling structures, giving it a distinct ancient and abandoned vibe. The theory connecting the forgotten temple to the sealed temple suggests that over the passage of time, the once grand sealed temple fell into ruin and became the forgotten temple seen in Breath of the Wild. The similarities in the architecture, the layout, and overall design of the two temples support this theory. Fans also point out that the location of the Forgotten Temple, high up in the mountains, is consistent with Skyward Sword's depiction of the sealed temple on a floating island. Additionally, the presence of guardians in the Forgotten Temple further aligns with Skyward Sword's narrative, where ancient technology is utilized to protect the temple. Impossible Out-of-Bounds Chests there are several instances of impossible or out-of-bounds chests that have intrigued and puzzled players. These chests are found in locations that are seemingly inaccessible or hidden beyond the boundaries of the game's intended play area. One of the most famous examples is the out-of-bounds chest located in Hyrule Castle. This particular chest is found on top of a rock pillar outside of the castle walls, seemingly impossible to reach through normal means. Players have devised various creative methods, such as using stasis on guardians or utilizing shield surfing techniques to launch themselves up to the chest to claim its contents. Another notable example is the Guardian Skywatcher chest, which is located on a floating platform high above Hyrule Castle. 
The chest appears to be out of reach as the platform is situated far above the highest elevation players can typically reach. However, players have discovered ways to exploit game mechanics and launch themselves up to the platform using various techniques such as bomb launches and paragliding from high elevations. These out-of-bound chests have become a fascination among players, as they provide a challenge and sense of accomplishment for those who manage to find and reach them. Their existence also adds an element of mystery and discovery to the game, as players are constantly searching for hidden secrets and unconventional paths. The classified photo is an image of young Pura. The classified photo is an important item that players can obtain as part of the A Parent's Love side quest. This photo is actually an image of young Pura, one of the Sheikah researchers in the game. The quest begins when Link visits Ateno village and meets Simon, a Sheikah researcher who asks for help in retrieving some lost research. He explains that the research involves a classified image of a young Sheikah girl, which he believes could be related to the ancient Sheikah technology found throughout Hyrule. After agreeing to help, Link embarks on a quest to find the missing photo. By following a series of clues and speaking to various characters, Link eventually learns that the photo is hidden away in Pura's laboratory, located in the Akala Ancient Tech Lab. Upon reaching the lab, the players must solve a puzzle including the lab's guidance stone to gain access to a hidden chamber. Inside this chamber, Link finds a chest containing the classified photo. When he examines the photo, it is revealed to be a picture of a young Pura standing alongside an ancient Shika guardian. This discovery not only proves to be a valuable insight into the past and history of the Shika tribe, but also sheds light on Pura's true identity and her involvement with the ancient technology. It is a significant moment in the game that deepens the lore and expands the player's understanding of the world of Breath of the Wild. Early E3 Map the early E3 map refers to a version of the game's map that was showcased during the Electronic Entertainment Expo in 2016. This map provided a glimpse into the vast open world that players would be able to explore in the final game. The early E3 map showcased the expansive land of Hyrule, which served as the game's setting. It revealed various regions, landmarks, and points of interest that the players could discover and interact with during their adventure. The map featured diverse environments such as lush forests, towering mountains, vast deserts, and serene lakes. One of the more notable features of the early E3 map was the presence of several iconic locations, including the Great Plateau, Hyrule Castle, and the Temple of Time. These landmarks played significant roles in the game's story and served as important areas for players to explore and conquer. Additionally, the map highlighted the vastness of the game world, giving players a sense of scale and freedom that they would have in Breath of the Wild. It showcased the non-linear nature of the game and allowing players to choose their own path and explore the vast landscapes in any order they desired. Spider's Nest Mountain Spider's Nest Mountain, aka Lanayru Mountain, is a location found in the game's vast open world of Hyrule. It is an area located in the northeastern part of the map, specifically in the Hebrew region. As the name suggests, Spider's Nest Mountain is known for its abundance of giant spiders and their webs. The mountain is characterized by its rocky terrain, steep cliffs, and icy slopes, making it a challenging area to navigate. It is also home to various types of enemies, including ice-based creatures, such as ice whizrobes and ice choo-choos. Exploring Spider's Nest Mountain can be quite perilous, as players will need to be cautious while traversing the uneven terrain and avoiding the spider webs. These webs can hinder movement and may even house enemies, making it necessary to cut through them or burn them using fire-based weapons or abilities. Within the mountain, the players can find treasure chests containing valuable items, weapons, and resources. Additionally, there are several Korok seeds hidden in this area which can be discovered by solving puzzles or interacting with specific objects. Unused Hookshot and Beetle Runes Obviously, there are a few unused features and items that were discovered during the game's development. Two of these unused elements are the Hookshot and Beetle Tunes. The Hookshot 
is a recurring element in the Zelda series that allows players to grapple onto objects and pull themselves towards them. In Breath of the Wild, an unused hookshot was found in the game's data. This item was likely intended to be a tool for traversing the world and reaching otherwise inaccessible areas, like chests. However, it was ultimately cut from the final game, possibly due to technical limitations or balancing issues. Despite being unused, the presence of the hookshot in the game's data sparked excitement among fans who hoped for its potential inclusion in future DLCs or sequels. The Beetle is a small, robotic flying companion that assists Link in certain tasks throughout the game. It can be controlled remotely to collect items or activate switches. In the game's data, there are unused Beetle tunes associated with the Beetle. These tunes were likely intended to serve as musical cues or commands for the Beetle's actions. However, their exact purpose or functionality remains a mystery as they were not implemented into the final game. These unused features and items provide a glimpse into the development process of Breath of the Wild, showcasing ideas that were ultimately left out of the final product. While players may have missed out on experiencing these features in the game, their discovery has sparked speculation and curiosity among fans about what could have been. Beyond Hyrule's Borders Venturing outside of Hyrule, players will encounter various terrains and environments, each with its own unique challenges and secrets to discover. These areas include dense forests, snowy mountain ranges, vast deserts, and even ancient ruins. The world is filled with wildlife, monsters, and NPCs that offer quests and information to aid Link on his journey. Exploration beyond Hyrule's borders is not limited by a linear progression, allowing players to freely roam and uncover hidden locations, treasures, and side quests. These areas often provide additional challenges and rewards, including powerful weapons, armor, and resources to aid in Link's quest. It's worth noting that the Breath of the Wild features an expansion called The Master Trials and a larger story-based add-on called The Champion's Ballad. These expansions introduce new challenges and provide further opportunities to explore the world beyond Hyrule. Scanning enemy health using the Sheikah Slate To scan an enemy's health using the Sheikah Slate, you first need to activate the Sheikah Slate and gain access to the camera rune. Then, while in close proximity to an enemy, take a picture of it by pressing the capture button. The game will automatically analyze the captured image and provide you with details about the enemy, including its name, health, and other relevant data. Once you have scanned an enemy, its information will be stored in the Hyrule Compendium, which serves as an in-game encyclopedia. This compendium keeps track of various enemies, animals, plants, and weapons you encounter throughout your journey. You can access the Hyrule Compendium from the Sheikah Slate's main menu and review the information you've gathered. Scanning enemies and filling in the Hyrule Compendium can be beneficial for players as it helps in identifying enemy weaknesses, planning strategies, and understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the different characters in the game. It also provides a sense of completion for those who enjoy collecting and cataloging information. And that's it for the Breath of the Wild Iceberg. Thanks so much for watching. I do hope you learned just a bit more about this great game. Uh, part 1 of the Ultimate Gen Z Nostalgia Iceberg will be out soon, so you can look forward to that. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.